back to the channel thank you for um, tuning in and um, I actually have uh, something kind of cool going on I got a little uh, different setting here tonight um, I'm actually in my bedroom um, we, we have a desk here that's been sitting here um, in fact when we moved into this house this this computer desk was sitting outside and so we ended up bringing it inside and we know we don't really use it um, and then there's Sammy hey buddy Give me a kiss. You give me a kiss. Mm. Mm. Uh, anywho, that's Sammy. You guys know him by now. He usually jumps on top of my lap, and I don't wouldn't doubt if he actually does it. But he loves his bed. <laughs> um, anywho, so I got a different setup going on. I love it. I got the little candle over here. Got a nice little candle. I got the lights dimmed out a little bit because this one is too much light, too bright. And I got my coffee, which is almost over, sadly enough. And it's almost, I guess it's 10 o'clock already and I'm drinking coffee and I'm tired, so I don't even know why I'm doing that. Actually, wait a minute. Yeah, it's 10, 10, 10 o'clock. Um, well, here, um, let's get to going. Let's, um, I love the setting. It's kind of mellow. Um, I have not, I don't have the best eyesight, so you're going to love this. Check this out. See these glasses right here? They make me look like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, don't they? That's right, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, that's how old I am. But watch this, you ready? Boom. <laughs> they have built-in uh, <laughs> built lights on it, so I can actually like read. And uh, this is amazing stuff, but uh, this is actually overkill, but um, I wouldn't need those, but I, I have my other glasses here. Anywho, let's, not, let's cut to the chase. <laughs> Um, let's not go ahead and continue to recap all of these, these, um, you know, all the way from the beginning because we'll, we'll never end like that. So what I'm going to do is if you guys want to catch up, check out the other videos that I have. Um, I'm going to try to actually number them so you guys can know which one came out first, even though the dates should reveal that. Um, but anyways, um, we've been talking about special revelation that revelation of God that is different from general revelation, that revelation from God that He that He um, uses, or that or that we we use as, as as Christians to to define how God reveals Himself through um, the Scriptures, for example, or, or the the means whereby God reveals Himself apart from nature, the trees and everything. So we, this is what we're, what we're talking about, special revelation. And so let's continue down, 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 uh, talking about this. Last video, I talked about, um, let's see, uh, that we talked about the Bible, right? Being, the, the, being preeminently uh, the Word of God. We believe that, that, um, that the Scriptures, the Bible, is inerrant. It, 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 it is um, the very word of God himself. God breathed it out. We believe that every single letter in this, in this book um, is exactly what God, what God wanted to be here. Um, we, we believe in the sovereignty of God enough to say that if there's one single letter that God didn't want to hear, it would have happened. Um, um, I believe that there is sufficient truth in here, which is... Let me be careful how I say that. I believe everything in here is the Word of God. Um, but if, if someone wants to debate that and say, well, you know, well, maybe this book shouldn't be there, or, or maybe that book shouldn't be there, um, I would go as far as saying this. I believe, we, we call this the canon of Scripture, right? 
which books of the Bible should belong, which shouldn't. Um, we're not going to touch that topic yet. This is a little bit more in the future. Actually, next topic or the next um, uh, theme would be the scripture. So we'll get more into that. But in passing, I just want to say that like, um, I do believe that exactly what we have now is exactly what we need for... And let me take that back because I don't want you guys to think that I, I'm doubting any of these books. Here's what I'm going to say. I believe that every single book in this Bible is exactly what God wants. End of the story. It, it, we have it all right here. And that there's not a single book in here, not one, whether it's the book of Job or whether it's the book of Esther or whether it's Nehemiah or, or Nahum or Malachi, you name it, Jude. Um, I believe that there's not one single book in here that should not have been here. Uh, and having said that, um, I'm going to say that every single thing that is in this Bible is sufficient for us to gain all of the knowledge, right, that we would need of God in this lifetime. Um, this, when we talk about, and I need to say this, when we talk about, um, when we sit down to talk about theology, we, we talk about theology is the study of God. The, one of the first doctrines that is devoted to the study of God is, is the doctrine that is called the incomprehensibility of God. And, and one can mistakenly think that what that means is that like God is incomprehensible, that no one can comprehend anything about him. But in reality, that's not what is meant by the incomprehensibility of God. What is meant by the incomprehensibility of God is meant um, that God cannot exhaustively be comprehended, meaning he cannot be exhaustively known. Um, and, and, and the question that we want to ask is this, do we have to have an exhaustive knowledge of anything in particular in order, in order for us to, be, to say that we have knowledge of that? I'll give you an example. I have knowledge of this phone. I have a lot of knowledge of this phone. A lot of knowledge. I know that it is black. I know that it has glass. I know that it has plastic. I know that it has lights. I know that I can touch it. I mean, I know a host of things about this stuff. And I know them to be true for sure. Like 100% they are true. I know it. I know I have a phone in my hand. I know for sure that it is black. Right. And, and, and I know that it has buttons. Right. But here's the thing. I don't know this phone, this phone exhaustively. I've never opened it up. I don't know how many chips are in there. I don't know exactly how it works. So there's a sense in which I don't know this phone exhaustively. But just because I don't know it exhaustively does not mean that I don't have proper knowledge of it. And, and it's the same thing with everything that we know, right? We don't know everything or anything for that matter exhaustively. I mean, put it this way. You don't even know yourself exhaustively, but you know yourself. And that's all we're trying to say is that when it comes to God, we can't know everything obviously exhaustively about him. But just because we can't know everything exhaustively about him doesn't mean that we don't get to have any knowledge about him. And so one of the things that we're careful uh, in saying is that like um, from a study of the scriptures, for example, right, that we can exhaust, exhaust God. We won't be able to. Um, not only because God hasn't, not only because God hasn't revealed himself exhaustively in the scriptures, not only because of that, but here's why. God is eternal. God is an infinite being and we are finite beings. A finite creature can never, ever exhaust the infinite. Um, one of the reformers, I don't remember who said this, whether it was Calvin or St. Augustine or Aquinas, but one of our forefathers, right, they, they, they used this frame, they, this phrase. They said, um, finitum non capax infinitum. And, and what is meant by finitum non capax infinitum, I think I got that right. <laughs> Google it. <laughs> but um, what is meant by that is literally is that the finite, right, finitum, which is the finite, cannot, right, which is non capax, which is C-A-P-A-X. 
And then the word kapax can be translated into either grasp or contain. Um, so literally the, the term means finitum non kapax, which the finite cannot grasp the infinite or the finite, the finite cannot contain the infinite. And the idea is, 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 is if, if all of the knowledge that we can get, right, in our system, let's say we are this cup, all of the knowledge that we're ever going to get is only going to be whatever we can fill in that cup. And so what we're saying about God is that it's not that God gives us this much knowledge about himself, and that to know God infinitely or exhaustively, we would have to have this type of knowledge up to here. And then we would know him exhaustively. We're saying that we'll never be able to contain God. Because in order for you to know God exhaustively, right? It's almost like if you're pouring water into the, the, the cup and the, the cup is actually overflowing so that the cup cannot contain all the water. And that's the idea behind exhausting the knowledge of God is because... We're like this cup. We can only contain so much. But knowledge of God overflows the cup. So we'll never be able to contain it because God is infinite and we are finite. I hope that makes sense. So, so all we're saying is that this, the scriptures only furnishes us with only, only the, the knowledge that he deemed necessary for our eternal future. Um, and for us to properly get to know him in this life. Um, and yet we don't know him exhaustively. Um, so I hope that makes sense and it's not confusing. Um, all that to say, again, um, but it, that, that the scriptures reveal to us, excuse me, enough information to get a good handle as to not only who God is, because we talked about that in the past, that's important, who God is and what he wants. The Bible tells us both of those. Who God is, it's, his, it's his, his biography, right? His autobiography, that's the Bible. And, and also, what is it that our creator, our lovely and beautiful creator wants from his creatures that he has made for his glory? And so I think that if, 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 if you want, listen to me carefully. I guess I'm getting like, I'm getting a little passionate here. So listen carefully. If you want your life to count, like to really count, um, we said this already in the past that I, I, I feel like I sound like a, like a clanging cymbal or something, but I hope I don't sound like a broken record. But if you really want your life to count, get to know God. Like, like there's no greater pursuit than the knowledge of God, like to know God, right? To know him. And 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 and, I, and if, what I'm saying is, read the Bible, like read it, um, find out who God is, so that then you can know who you are, because you're never gonna know who you are. I mean, you can go around life trying to define yourself, because like we talked about er earlier, um, you don't know this phone exhaustively. I don't know it exhaustively because I don't even know myself exhaustively. Like, here's my question for you if you think you know yourself that well. How many hairs do you have in your, in, your, in your eyebrows? Count. I'm waiting. You don't know that. I mean, we can play this game and, and literally sit here for a good three weeks and you, and you will always answer, oh, I don't, I don't know that. Here's another question. How many ounces of blood do you have in your arm right now? You don't know that. Like, you, you, there's, there's a zillion things you have no idea about your body, about you, about your thoughts, about your heart, about the things that you do. So what I'm suggesting is that if you got to know God, right, if you got to know him, if you, if you search the scriptures to find him, I believe that the scriptures will reveal to you who you are. Um, again, not exhaustively. But we won't know God exhaustively, and we can't know anything in this earth exhaustively. But I'll tell you one thing. You will know God a thousand times better than what you think you might know him now. And you'll most certainly know yourself a lot better. And, and the, because the Bible itself is not just a textbook on who God is, but it's also a textbook on who we are. And so if you want to know exactly who you are, look at the Bible. The Bible is no respecter of persons. 
It, it looks you in the face. And as the scripture says, it pierces through bone and marrow. It pierces right through you. And, and it pulls no punches. It tells you exactly who you are. And this is one of the things about Christians that, that we, we talk about the Bible, right? We believe it is the word of God, but we don't believe it's the word of God just because like, well, I, I, I want to believe that. No, no, no. Like there's, to us, there's ample evidence that this is the word of God. We talked about um, the fact that it doesn't contain any contradictions. We talked about the fact that um, that the Bible claims that it is the, the Word of God. Therefore, it elevates the, the credibility or the stakes that it could be the Word of God. And all, we also talked about the prophecies that have been fulfilled that are ridiculous, right? Um, but here's the thing. The uncanny, the unbelievable, the unparalleled way in which this Bible is able to, watch this, even better than a mirror to show me exactly who I am. 2,000 years later, this Bible has the ability to show me exactly who I am. And guess what? If I want to know who Danny is, I can look in the mirror, right? Or I can say, what does the Bible say about me? And this thing has an amazing ability to cut through my heart and to, and to floor me because I am like, oh my goodness, this is an actual, listen to this carefully. This is an actual autobiography, not only of who God is, right? But of our constituent makeup. Like who we are as humans, it's all in here. How God created us, how we rebelled against him, how we continue to act psychologically because we suppress the truth of God. Because in us, there's something in us that's, that, that, the, that, is, that, the, that the presence of God haunts and so on. And so this is on point. But don't take my word for it. Read it. And so this is the, this is the call. I've gone 16 minutes into it. I haven't even read a Bible verse or gone into the uh, Louis Burkhoff. So let's go ahead and do a, a short, short, short survey um, quickly. We're, we're only going to talk about the means of special revelation. In other words, um, we believe that God has specially revealed himself, not only through nature, but specially through his word. But it's not just the Bible that he used to reveal himself specially to us. Here's what he's saying. What other means what other avenues did God use to communicate to humanity? Here it is. In giving his special or supernatural revelation, God used different kinds of means. Watch this. Such as, number one, here's the first one. It's called theophanies or visible manifestations of God. Now, immediately we have to stop and ask, what in the world is a theophany? What is a theophany? Now, if you are listening to me and you know what it is, right? Good for you. <laughs> um, but for those who are listening and don't know what it is, um, the way you spell it is T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N-I-E-S. Theophanies. Or if it's uh, singular, it'll be P-H-A-N-Y. Theophany. Um, what is it? Well, we, we, we speak about theology, right? And we use the word theology to describe the study of God because um, we have the word theos, which is T-H-E-O-S, theos, and then we add the word logos at the end. Logos means word, right? Word. And then theos means God. So a word of God or a study of God, if you will. So when we talk about theology, that's what we mean, the study of God. Logi, or biology, right? Anthropology is the study of God or the word about the, the study of God. But so then the word theos, that's what the word, um, the word God means uh, theos, T-H-E-O-S. So when we talk about theophany, there's the same uh, word, uh, theos. So it's a theophany. And now the question is, what is the P-H-A-N-Y? And we use words like epiphany. Now, we use that in our common vernacular or our common language, and we say things like, oh, I had an epiphany. Um, what do we mean by epiphany? Well, we talk about a theophany. 
Well, all that is meant with an epiphany, right? It's something that has been revealed to you, right? You say, wow, I just got an epiphany. <laughs> well, the word epi, E-P-I, means close or uh, at hand or uh, onto or above, right? It can even mean like great or super, right? Um, so when we talk about an epiphany, we're talking about like, a, a, a super revelation or wow, I just got a super revelation. I got an epiphany. Anyways, let me not overlabor that. But when we talk about a theophany, we're talking about, so let me take this back. Funny comes from the Greek word phaneros, which literally means to manifest, to reveal, or to make known, right? Um, and there's this idea that something is hiding and it's concealed and then once you open up that box and now it is revealed, that's the word fun and ross. And, and so um, when we talk about a theophany, we're talking about something that is concealed and now revealed. Um, but it is a revelation of who? Of theos, which is God. So all we're saying with a theophany is a literally a God manifestation. It is a manifestation or a revelation of God. It made manifest, that, if you will. Like, he reviews himself all of a sudden. And so, here's the question. Where do we see that in the scriptures? Do we see the scripture ever giving a theophany about God? And the answer is a resounding yes. There's a lot of theophanies in the scriptures. And that's what Burkhoff is saying, that God manifested himself through theophanies. And... Um, one of the ways in which he, he, he uh, revealed himself, for example, through a theophany was when he rescued the people out of slavery, uh, the, the people out of Egypt, uh, his people, and then he would reveal themselves through a pillar of cloud or through a cloud of smoke or whatever, you know, like, uh, or, or the, the, the Moses and the burning bush, like that burning bush was said to be uh, the presence of God in there so that we say that God manifested himself in the bush, right? We don't say that the bush was God, but that God revealed himself through the bush. And for that, we call it theophany, a, a manifestation of God. Um, um, there's a lot of, of, of theophanies in the Bible that, um, uh, that describe God revealing himself. We also talk about what we call Christophany. And a Christophany is a, 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 a manifestation of Christ. And that's why we say Christophany. And so a Christophany is the man. I don't know why my, my face is itchy, but a Christophany is a manifestation of Christ in the Old Testament. And we also see that in the scriptures, a pre-incarnate um, manifestation. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. But um, so here's what Burkhoff says. Theophanies or vis visible manifestations of God. Watch this. God revealed his presence in the fire and clouds of smoke. This is found in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, and Exodus 33, verse 9, also. And then watch this. It says, God revealed himself through stormy winds. And, what? this is beautiful, God also revealed himself. If you remember the story of Elijah, right, when he was persecuted by Jezebel, when he felt like he was all alone, and then he, he ran away from serving God, and he hid inside of a mountain or inside of a cave or whatever, and God appeared or whatever, and there was a, an earthquake and so on and so forth, and a mighty wind, and God wasn't in it. And then finally, there was a small voice, a still small voice, that in that still small voice, God manifested himself, right? In other words, God manifested himself through a still small voice to the uh, ears of Elijah, and he was able to recognize, wow, this is God speaking. So we call those theophanies. So all we're saying with, with the theophanies is that this is a way in which God specially revealed himself to people. So it's not just the trees screaming to us that God exists, but God himself is taking the initiative uh, to, to reveal himself further, right? And, and Burkhoff, right before this, which I kind of skipped over, but Burkhoff right before, right before this says that the reason why God reveals himself in these ways is because general revelation is not enough to save us. And so this is God's way, if you will, of restoring our relationship with God, right? Through him revealing himself through these avenues. And lastly, let me say this, which I'm going to say again in the next video, but I'm going to say it again this time. The chief manifestation of, of, of God through a theophany is through Christ. 
And so let me now read the next uh, line that Virgo says. He says, um, he says, the highest point, I love this, the highest point of the personal appearance of God among men was reached in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. How beautiful is that? That if God is screaming to people, I'm here through candles, through candles, I'm here through fire, through water, through, through rain, right? Which is still water, <laughs> through, through birds, through, um, through the wind, God is revealing himself and, and it's still not enough to people. So what does God do? He condescends and he reveals himself through visions, through dreams, through people, through the pillar of cloud, through stormy winds, through still small voices. And if that's still not enough, I will go down there and show them my glory. And he did that through his son. So the, what is amazing, and actually this is really unbelievable and, and extremely encouraging. God is not a God that is aloof and far away. He came down. Jesus' name was Emmanuel. He was to be called Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. The highest point of God's theophany, of his manifestation among us, was Jesus Christ, like in a flash, boom, right there, in the incarnation, boom, we have a baby. God, a very God among us. Here's my question. How much would you give? And be honest with this. Be honest, like straight honest. How much are you willing to give of whatever you have right now to have been standing right there in the midst of that family, Mary and Joseph, when that little baby Jesus was born? What would you give to have seen God incarnate? What would you give to, to say, if only I would have touched Jesus, I'll be cool. What would you give for that? Well, I would probably say this. I would be tempted to think that it would be better if I can feel him, taste him, and touch him, right? Because at least I saw God in the flesh and I saw God walking among us. I think there is a greater blessing for those who believe in the Son of God without seeing, without tasting, without touching. I really believe that. So if you are here today, maybe you don't see the incarnate Son of God. And maybe you will never see Him in this lifetime. But if you believe in Him, that's a greater blessing in my judgment than to have seen Him face to face. In the flesh, at least here. And the reason why I say that is because we are looking back to what Jesus has done for us. And we are trusting and believing that these things are true. And so my question for us is, are you looking forward to seeing him face to face, to touching him, to, to, to finally saying, wow. And, and actually, let me say this to close. I'm definitely going to do it before 30 minutes here. Watch this. God has always been a spirit from eternity. He has always been a spirit, right? God is a spirit. And we believe in the Trinity. We believe that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which existed from all eternity, right? As spirit, three in one. Watch this. When Jesus Christ comes down to the earth and assumes the flesh, he assumes flesh and, and a human soul like we have. He becomes like us. Watch this. He dies on the cross. He resurrects. But how does he resurrect? Certainly he does not resurrect as a spirit. His body, flesh, like ours, resurrects. And what happens? He ascends to his father in the flesh. And as we're speaking right now, he sits at the right hand of the father in the flesh. 
having become like us in all ways, so that we may be able to, as humans, this is so beautiful, to grasp him, to touch him, to feel him, to hold on to him, because that which was spirit was made flesh and will be so, watch this, forever. That's so comforting. Now, I think that even if Jesus didn't come in the flesh, we would still be able to glory in, in, in God in spirit, for sure. Because we worship in spirit and in truth, but we also, in one sense, are going to be able to touch him and, and to hold him and feel him. I think that is brilliant. I think it is beautiful. So, for the sake of time, I wish I can keep talking for an hour or two hours, but I try to keep these as short as possible and I keep going over, but I apologize for that. Thank you for hanging with me. Thank you for... for um, even sometimes I'm so grateful that these, these videos have 10 views or, or 15 views. Honestly, like, uh, it's not that I'm shooting for, for, for crowds. I'm not, uh, I am so, so grateful that I'm able to produce these videos and you guys are able to hear them and listen to them and hopefully get something out of it. And if, it, if, if it allows you to draw nearer to God and to, to see that, that, that this channel is trying to make much of God as possible, as much as possible, then hey, thank you so much for, um, for tuning in. Thank you for supporting this channel. Um, I pray that you will pass it forward if you find it to be a blessing for you. And um, even if you don't, pass it forward. <laughs> God bless you. Um, I'll do a next video on, on more of this revelation stuff and scripture. So God bless, and I'm about to spend some time with my kitty cat. Love you guys. See ya.